Hey everyone, uh, today we are going to look at a story called Any Person Living or Dead. Uh, this is a story which has appeared on my um, Patreon page, and many of you may be actually watching this on Patreon. Uh, what that story came from was that uh, Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing has a Patreon page that I'm a supporter of, and at the $5 level you get a story prompt, and then the great editors uh, from that particular publisher will then uh, give you editing suggestions for that particular story. Um, the story that I did put together for that has already appeared on Patreon, but now it's gone through some edits, and I was going to read it and then uh, address the comments uh, from a professional editor. We may take a look at their Patreon page just so you can see the benefit that you can get from that. I think it's a real good value. Um, and then, of course, those of you watching this on Patreon, hopefully uh, this video serves as some good value for you as well. So we're going to take a look at um, this particular story now. So you give me a moment to switch scenes and then bring up the story itself. All right, so this is Any Person Living or Dead. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the idea behind the story and uh, how the edits work. Now, we're in track changes. If you see up at the top middle of the screen, uh, track changes is there. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can do this. Uh, if you click the next button, uh, it takes you down through. Uh, now, something that I did with this one that I don't normally do is I went ahead and accepted all changes. So one of the options on here uh, is that you can uh, do accept all changes, accept all changes and stop tracking. I don't generally do that because I want to look at them uh, bit by bit. Uh, if it's just a comma change or um, you know a, a correction of a typo, I'm going to automatically do it. Uh, typically, when I uh, go through an edit, one thing that I'll do is I don't I don't read it like I'm about to do here. I'll go through hitting this next button up here, taking myself to the next comment, the next um, edit, and I'll just accept the edits or or uh, reject the edits as we go through. And then when I get to a comment, I'll go ahead and address that comment unless it's something very broad, like a large section of the story needs to be changed, um, then that's something I'll probably come back to later. But I go through all those changes without uh, reading the story specifically, just looking at the change. Once I've completed all those, addressed all the comments I can, um, addressed uh, all the changes I can, I do um, one last accept all changes and then take the tracking off, and then I'll go back and read the story. Uh, it's important to do because there's little things that can be messed up, like um, there can be extra spaces in, extra periods, stuff that the track changes kind of accidentally put in. Um, I got someone in chat. What am I going to do? Uh, thank you, Clever, for coming in. Clever is actually the first and only follower that I have at the moment, so I'm really excited to uh, really excited to see you. I appreciate you being on here as I'm kind of learning learning the um, learning the ropes here. So. Uh, I appreciate that support of, of someone that's brand new on the site. So thanks for coming on, man. Um, like I said, what I did this time, I went ahead and, and accepted all changes, which I don't normally do. All that did was accept like all the commas that were put in, all the periods, all the um, typos. I looked through, and most of them were um, small things like that, so nothing that uh, was going to be something that I would reject. Uh, if I were getting this ready to uh, specifically publish, then I would I would go through it more carefully. So any person living or dead, I'll look at the first comment. Uh, Max Booth is someone that I know well. He's actually an excellent author in addition to being um, a great editor. So this is a good deal having him look through here. All right, so this one is attached to the title. Typically when an editor attaches... Um, uh, attaches a comment of the title. It's broad towards the entire story. Um, uh, there's a lot going on in the story, but I love the general concept. I think the story works at its best when it's uh, John, Jake, and Devin interacting up until their encounter. I was having a hard time giving a shit since <laughs> the initial gimmick gets boring quickly. I recommend discarding the montage of dead celebrities and instead discuss focus on Devin. I'd cut the story in half easily and make everything overall much stronger. Okay, so that's a broad comment. Um, there is a possibility that, um, you know, comments like that can, like, bother somebody if they're going through. Um, and uh, the 
if you if you don't have a thick skin, you could read that and think that they're insulting the story. When in fact, the editor's job is to say, listen, uh, if you make these hard cuts, you have a better story. Now, that's a broad one. So if I were going to follow that, I'd be deleting almost the first half of the story and then just kicking in with the second part, um, which might be fine. But that's the kind of thing that I would come back to later on. All right, I'm about to, oh, hey, I, I know you on Twitter. Okay. Hey, Josh, it's good to see you, man. Um, I didn't I didn't realize that we already knew each other. That's cool that you're following me on here, too. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read through as I'm, uh, as I'm addressing the comments. So the spark of life crackled, not enough for him to know, but to sense he was dead, had been dead, and still was dead. So we got another comment here. Uh, let's see what he wants me to change. Be beginning of the sentence is worded weirdly, and it's going to trip the reader up. I think it, it's because it is not immediately obvious that it's referring to the spark of life. So the, the, um, the, the it that's being discussed in the second sentence isn't clear that it refers back to the first sentence he's saying. Um, since the first sentence comes off as a little isolated. It's a good first sentence, and you should keep it, but the imagery is too vague for the next sentence to work. Solution, another sentence between these two. Describe something more physical, something the reader can latch on to. Also, maybe italicize no and sense. The second half of the highlighted sentence, he was dead, he had been dead, and still was dead is fantastic. Okay, so a lot of positive there, but there needs to be something between. All right, one suggestion for him... I'm actually going to delete this comment because I'm about to address it. Um, all right, let me go ahead and say result. Let me get rid of it. Okay, one um, suggestion he made was to um, italicize the no and sense. So I'm going to do that flat out and go back to home. As soon as my computer catches up with me. Um, all right. So I'm going to italicize no. So I'll do that. Italicize no. And italicize sense. His, his purpose behind that is to tell me that uh, we want to indicate that these are um, sort of ethereal feelings that he's having. Okay, now he needs a sense in between something more physical. The spark of life crackled is this idea that he's dead as the story begins. And so there's there's some kind of life coming back in. So there needs to be a physical sense sentence in between. Um, usually, if it's physical, it needs to be a little more visceral for a story like this. So I'm going to um, add in something like he felt the cold and the decay between his bones and is flesh. All right. So let me read that again. The spark of life crackled. He felt the cold and the decay between his bones and his flesh. Not enough for him to know, but to sense he was dead, had been dead, and still was dead. Okay, so that's a that's a good comment that he gave there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and delete this um, top comment. I understand what he's asking me to do. And if I go back to that, I'm um, almost definitely going to be cutting a large portion of the story. For my purposes here, I'm going to just continue through uh, the edits uh, as they are and, and possibly come back to that at a future date. Something else that I was looking at, um, at doing is um, because of the nature of the story, there's, there's people dead and alive that are coming into these scenes. And uh, I included several um, famous people from history. I included several authors. One thing I did not include was um, I didn't include any female authors. So I'm going to have to give that some thought. And if I go back to prepare this for a publisher at some point, I am definitely going to include more female uh, representation in, uh, in this story. I, I neglected to do that the first time. All right, before he knew his name, he was sitting at the table with the dungeon master rolling dice behind a chewed cardboard barrier. Before he could remember his name sounds better here. Okay, that's a good note. Let me get that out of the way. Before he knew his name, he was sitting. He found himself sitting. All right, I'm going to do that too. All right, delete comment. Say before he could remember his name, could remember 
is and I popped an E out there. Before he could remember his name, he was sitting, he found himself sitting. Found himself sitting. I'm getting weird spaces here. I don't know if that's with uh, track changes or not. All right. Before he could remember his name, he found himself sitting at the table with the dungeon master rolling dice behind a chewed cardboard barrier. The fellow next to him leaned over and whispered, you got to play along. The dungeon master was skin a skinny, hairy little man. Welcome to the game, Jake. Let me take you, take you around the table. The fellow who had whispered a warning to Jake was Stanley. On the DM's left was author Conan Doyle. Arthur Conan Doyle, need to read my own story. Then Robert E. Howard. The fellow giving him a dirty look was Colin Grinwald. Then Brian Keane, H.P. Lovecraft, then Harlan Ellison to John's immediate right and back to John. Everyone, this is the recently passed Jake Foster. The swimmer, Colin asked. Brian answered. Okay, here we are at another um, comment. Could easily avoid a dialogue tag here by replacing with an action. Brian shook his head. Dialogue tags are boring. It should be avoided unless totally necessary. And even then, try to make it a, sing a simple said. Yeah, he's right, and I tend to do that most of the time. Um, the reason to have an editor sometimes is to remind you of things that you already know. Okay, so instead of Brian answered, I'm going to say... I could go with just Brian said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the suggestion. It's, it's pretty simple, but we'll say Brian shook his head. Simple enough. Keeps the action going. No, he was he was a writer too. Sorry to see it go, John. That's okay, Jake. That's okay. Jake didn't know what else to say. He, okay. At this point, we should have a better sense of Jake's thought process. Is he confused by the current surroundings? Is there any familiarity? Is he scared? To outsiders, this seems like a weird situation and to suddenly find oneself in. Does Jake find it weird or normal to himself? Okay. I need to go more into the character's head here. So let me see how I would do that. All right. Jake, I need to do it up here. Jake didn't know what else to say. He was confused. He never played D and D in life. Why the hell would he be doing so now? All right, let me see if that makes sense. That's okay, Jake. Didn't know what else to say. He was confused. He never played D&D &D in life. Why the hell would he be doing so now? All right. We had a whole paragraph without a comment, so we're, we're doing a little better here. He was playing a druid healer in the game, so there wasn't a lot for him to do. Colin argued with Harland and kept getting upset at Jake for not knowing the rules. The adventure went off, went way off track, and the DM, an accountant, and a YouTube reaction video star seemed overwhelmed, but happy with the gathering. All right, now we're here. Since, since we used Jake and knew in the next sentence, too, maybe mix it up a little bit and rephrase the sentence with something like, recollection started drifting forward. Okay, maybe... All right, let me clear that comment, and then we'll see what I can do with it. Okay, Jay started to remember how he knew the names. Um, we'll say for Jake. For Jake. Yeah, that's a good one. Told you Max was a good good uh, author. Jake's, for Jake, we'll say recollection began to come forward. Recollection. I need to lowercase that. Recollection began to come forward. All right. He knew Keene from the horror convention circuit. Colin wrote barbarian knockoffs of Howard and cosmic horror derivatives of Lovecraft. And Jake wrote crime fiction, movie tie in novels, some sci fi, and a fantasy series he never finished. He only remembered that much because Brad, the DM, kept asking him how it would have ended. I don't remember, Jake said. I think I was making it up as I went. Brad hated that answer more than the hostile play of the other gamers around the table. Keen and Grinwald were the only 
two still alive, not counting Brad. Right before the adventure ended, with everyone getting throttled by a swarm of monsters, I need to put a comma there, comma, Jake had never, oh, sorry, throttled by a swarm of monsters Jake had never heard of, he put t together two things. The guy to his left wasn't some guy named Stanley. He was the comic book guy, Stan Lee. Also, Jake Foster was a pen name. He was really John Vadseth. Okay, the comment is, this is great. All right, let's read it with the comment highlighted because um, it's always good to get some feedback that it's actually going great. Yes, editors definitely do make a big difference. Um, no matter how good you think you are, you need someone who's uh, willing to tear into you a little bit. Um, I've gone through a lot of editors uh, over over the years, not necessarily because uh, they were working or not working, um, but you got to find someone that works for your style and then someone that's willing to lay into you. And then also, as you um, are working on a novel series and stuff like that, you got to find someone that understands your voice and will let you get away with the things that you need to get away with to be you. All right, so let's see what Max liked. John leaned over to Stan. How, how are... How are we here? Stan chuckled, but didn't have a chance to answer before everything dissolved. John sank back down into his own corpse. He felt his mind fraying at the edges. He knew he was dead, and his body rotted around him without a hint of life to explain his sudden game night. Before his phantom mind gave out, he sensed that decaying should hurt, but there was nothing to feel along blackened flesh, cold nerves, and melting guts. The spark snuffed out. But nothing important marked its dying. All right. So I must have done a good job there. Sometimes I know that editors find something to say they like, uh, just so you don't feel like they're uh, bothering you. I think Max knows me well enough that he would not um, put in the false compliments to kind of keep my ego up. So it's nice that he liked that. John remembered the Dungeons and Dragons game before he remembered his name this time. Then the details of his life came back, including the pen name. First followed, by, first, followed by his real name. Will that be all, sirs? John looked up from his steak and vegetables at the waiter. I think we're good, said a guy with glasses and a sports coat that looked like it had belonged to the kid's dad. Early 20s, a key demographic. The other tables around the restaurant had other pairings. John didn't recognize anyone, so he thought he might just be eating in a normal place until he spotted someone who looked like he could be Abraham Lincoln, top hat and all, eating with a 10-year-old kid. Same thing with George Washington, a few tables over on the other side. John had, John had taken him for a grandfather with his granddaughter at first glance. The corner booth could have been Shakespeare. I had always hoped to meet you in real life, Mr. Foster. I never got the chance. You stopped doing conventions. John stared down at the steak. He wasn't really hungry, but he wasn't sure when he'd get a chance to eat again. Mr. Foster, the conventions? John looked up from the utensils in his hand. Uh, yeah, no, I got kind of tired of the convention circuit. Even when they paid for rooms, I never made my, my money back on trips. But it should have been about the fans, Jake. Can I, can I call you Jake? We supported your work and now don't have a chance to meet you, in real life, I mean. And we'll never know how crossbows and six-shooters will end. Once he figured out how to hold a fork again, he cut into the steak and saw it was well done. Okay, so this is hell, right? All right, Max laughed out loud at that. That's good. Humor and horror doesn't always work. It's sometimes difficult uh, to, um, to make that work. What? John looked around the restaurant for the waiter. Jesus. Was that Jesus or was it Charles Manson? Jake. Yes. So how does it end? CNS. Tell me. I saved up for this. John looked down at his stake again. Maybe you should get your money back, he thought. CNS, Six Guns. That fantasy series was a cross-genre thing between epic fantasy and spaghetti western. John shook his head. My agent hated that fucking thing. What? The guy's face flushed, but then he smiled. Oh, this is the Behind the Veil stuff I was looking for. Behind the Veil was the title of the first book in the series. He hated that title even more once the series got popular. He thought cross-genre couldn't sell, so uh, wanted me to show what he knew. Fuck that guy. Am I right, Jake? John looked around the miserable horror, historic figures to see if anyone looked up, looked up at the outburst. 
Even Jesus Manson looked bored as shit. He did his best to wash down a dry hunk of steak, but the wine was fruity swill. It all settled like a brick in his stomach. Felt like it wasn't digesting at all. Are you sure they rendered you correctly? You look shorter than I thought you'd be, and you seem kind of retarded. Don't think you're allowed to use that word anymore. With all the rape in your stories fostered, didn't think you'd be a fucking snowflake SJW. All right, Booth says, feels weird for him to call him by his last name when he's already put emphasis on Jake. That is a good note. All right, so since the character presumed to call him by his first name, at least the uh, um, at least the, the pen name, first name, then we're going to stick with that. So every word that's Foster for the rest of this, we're going to uh, switch to Jake. All right, John tried to wish he was somewhere else, but no, nowhere came to mind. He could picture the laptop on his desk. To the left of where he usually sat was a dry erase board with all his current projects. Immediate deadlines near the top, upcoming in the middle, the wish list items near the bottom, which rarely ever got to the top as the years ticked on. He couldn't picture the rest of the house or anyone in it. He knew something coiled in the leaves outside, and it made his throat tight. The more he tried to put it out, put it, the more he tried to pull it up, the more he just saw the inside of a box with silk-covered padding, stained with a body melting into dirt and slime. He could see the sections of his dry erase board clearer, though. Same thing as the first with the last names. Okay, I'm going to switch this to Jake to delete the comment. All right. Instead of Foster, we're going to say Jake. And Jake, I'm going to save here so my computer might freak out. Um, Jake, you going to sleep on me now? The rape scenes were integral to the plot. You described tits and ass better than any fantasy author alive. I'm um, sorry, I mean... Whoever lived, you know what I mean. John found his thoughts back at the bottom of the dry erase board where dreams settled forever and stained the board in black. I was going to write some straight westerns, an anti-hero lone gunman type, trying to get away from everything, but getting drawn back into helping others. I started crossbows and six shooters because I didn't think I could write a real western, but I went to write, wanted to write the kind of books my dad would have liked. Before I died, I wanted to write the kind of books he read to me when I was... In the last two books, the guy cut in, Lady Violet and Marshal Sodsword had joined forces to overthrow the bandit lords. Are you sure they would have, they would do that after what happened at the ble in the bleeding times? John sighed and tried to come up with an answer that didn't involve some version of they would because I fucking made them up, so they would do what he damn well decided they would do. All right, missing word here or something doesn't read as you intended. Okay. Another thing editors do well is see when you're missing a word. Sometimes you'll end up just putting it back in um, on your own. All right, let me see if I can find what's missing here. John sighed and tried to come up with the answer that didn't involve some version of they would, they would, have, I'll say would have, because I effing made them up so they would do what because he made them up so they would do what he damn well decided they would do. Okay, I think that's right. I might have to go back and reread it. The waiter cleared the greasy plates. Jesus Manson and the ex-presidents faded away from tables. Where the F are we? I'm going to pull out some cussing so that I don't get bumped off of uh, Twitch or something for doing it too much. As John tried for a third time to explain what the adult king was not about to, okay. As John tried for the third time to explain that the adult king was not about the current president because the books were started before that guy was elected, the waiter brought dessert. His mouth watered, but the saliva tasted spoiled. Can I get cheesecake or key lime pie, maybe? I like tiramisu. I can't wait to tell people I had tiramisu with John Foster over all the CNS inside dirt, intentionally merging both his real and pen name. No, that is a mistake on my part. Um, I used his real first name and his pen name last name. Um, so I'm going to need to fix that. Again, he is doing a good job. <laughs> Made some peppermint tea. 
<laughs> I, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of the gamers do cuss a lot. You're right. Um, I'm going to move this over to YouTube too, though, so I'll be a little careful. I, I put it more in stories than I do when I'm when I'm broadcasting. Also, I'm used to doing that faith podcast, so I try to never cuss at all in those. I'll uh, I'll loosen up here a little bit. All right. Can I get a cheesecake or a key lime pie? Maybe. I like tiramisu. I can't wait to tell people I had tiramisu with Jake Foster over all the CNS inside dirt. Two bites were all he could handle. Sharp pains in his gut robbed the joy of eating after death. John wasn't following the conversation anymore either. He managed to hold on to the fork when the pain in his knuckles spread through the bones into his wrists and forearms. He was like arthritis, but had something more nauseating below the pain. He felt his stomach try to push everything from the dry steak to the two bites of dessert back the wrong direction. When he focused on his hands, he dropped the fork on the cloth table with a dull thud, blue and purple, with black bone showing through the drawn flesh. His nails had, hadn't grown. The cuticles retracting just made them appear longer as they peeled away like scabs on the end of numb fingers. He only felt the rotten pain in his arms because there was nothing left to feel below them. All right, Let's scroll on down. Ooh, long stretches with no comments. I must be doing great. John drew his hands off the table into his lap. He wanted to hold them out in the air, away from his body to keep the rod away, but he didn't want anyone left in the dining room to see. He looked up for a sign of horror on the fanboy's face, but the guy sucked the last smear of tiramisu off the prongs of his fork while staring over some empty tables. John felt his bowels finally start to wake up and undigested hunks of dinner and shitty wine moved with bubbling urgency that signaled disaster. Is there a restroom nearby? The guy laughed. Why would there be? I think it may be time to call it a night. It's been mostly lovely, Foster. Again, I'll probably change this to Jake. It's been mostly lovely, Jake. All right. You're not half the asshole your critics try to make you out to be. John looked down in his lap to see lifelike color back in the flesh even through the knuckle bones, even though the knuckle bones were red and swollen. He extended his hand to shake. Thanks, I guess. The kid just stared at John's hand extended. The man boy's Adam ap Adam's apple bobbed. John thought he saw the truth rot, rot through this fantasy after all. The guy coughed, nodded, and fled the table. He wasn't two steps away before John sunk back into the darkness of the silky stained box. Arthritic decay replaced his churning gut only a moment before it was all gone. All right, next scene. Again, Max suggested that these, some of these scenes uh, get cut. Uh, so I think he wants it to be a little shorter um, than than what I have it, which may be which may be appropriate. It is it is kind of a story built on a gimmick, um, so it's it's tempting to play the gimmick out too long. Anyway, dove in with a jab, an uppercut combo, putting the young executive who challenged him into the ropes. Old Ernie backed off instead of following through and held his arms and fists in front of his face like a 1920s boxer. Crowd noise swelled even though the arena was empty except for the waiting combatants. John shook his head from the seats below the ring. He was sure the old man had seen modern boxing. He didn't like the mustache. That kind of mustache reminded him of Predators. I'm not sure how it works, but it's, it's something that they pay for. Jean Robert Udo, only a hint of a French accent. All right, missing a word or two. You are correct. John Jean Robert Udo spoke with only a hint of a French accent. The exec came off the ropes with a straight punch to the throat, staggering Hemingway backward. John put his pulled his attention from the fight. He remembered some installation protest the French Japanese artist had done with bird skulls, feathers, and beads outside an oil company headquarters in New York. Do you remember how he died? John asked. Right, sure I still have my cursor over here. Do you remember how he died? John asked. Don't remember, but sometimes, but someone told me a while back. Udo didn't offer anything else. John could remember. John could remember how he died either, but not being able to remember the inside of his house or the people he loved who might have lived there bothered him more. How many of these have you been through, John asked. Fights or encounters total? Encounters. Um, many of it. Dozens. Maybe closing in on a hundred. 
Most people want to talk about my work over coffee. That's fine. Boring, but fine. The fights are usually with some big shot I piss off. The sex stuff is a real hit and miss. Hemingway punched to the gut and the kidney before shoving his opponent into the turnbuckle and laughing with both arms raised in the air. air. Sex stuff. Udo cut him a look and shrugged. No one has pulled you into an orgy yet? John blinked and swallowed. No, no. I, I had to rub some woman's feet while, once while reading poetry. That wasn't the best. It wasn't even my work. I think she had me confused with another writer. It, it'll happen eventually. Always awkward. The young buck in the ring, with both eyes swelled up, locked up with the writer. He tripped Hemingway and put him into an armbar. The lackluster ref didn't interfere. The elbow snapped the wrong way with the sound of dry kindling. Hemingway's face contorted and everything above his nose caved in to the busted pumpkin of his skull. Eyes collapsed into the shattered sockets, and he swallowed his teeth before he vanished from the ring in black vapor. How does it work for people who are still alive? Do they remember it happening like we do? Udo shrugged. I think it may be like a dream they don't remember, except while they are in it. The current and previous president had three matches each before you got here. How did they do? About as good as you might expect. The executive had his arm raised above where Hemingway vanished. The voice crackled during his war cry. His voice cracked during his war cry, and he got the hiccups as he left the ring. Udo dropped the towel off his shoulders as he stood. Do you believe in God? John laughed. No, do you? Udo shook his head and moved toward the ring steps. It's easier if you can pretend to, though. This is all pretend, afterlife performance art. All this makes me believe in God a little less. Good luck. Udo rolled his eyes as he stepped through the ropes. The artist faced off with, against a burly man with salt and pepper hair. John didn't recognize him, but the guy hated Udo enough to spit in his face instead of touching gloves. The ref didn't call him on it. Udo kept his guard up and circled during the match, but didn't throw any punches. Each time he got hit, a purple ring around his neck grew darker and darker. John checked the card and saw Teddy Roosevelt and Fidel Castro were up before him. All right, next scene. John sat down at the chessboard in the park. The kid across from him couldn't have been in high school yet. He held out his closed fist and John picked. The kid opened his hand and revealed a black pawn. As the kid set up the pieces, John took a deep breath and smelled cut grass and stagnant water. Under it, he thought he could still smell the coffin he was inside. People moved through the park around them, families, kids, babies, dogs walking, and frisbees tossing. A cop rode by on a horse. There were buildings in the distance to the left and behind the kid's back. They didn't look familiar, not New York. He couldn't pull out any words from the drone of chatter on the breeze, no telling if it was English or not, just ambient noise for this new fantasy. When John didn't set up the black pieces himself, the kid did it for him. After that, the boy moved his pawn and hit the timer. The ticking dug into John's brain, so he clicked it off. Are you giving up? The kid asked. You're supposed to play me. Why? The kid thought for a moment. Because I picked you. Of all, of any person living or dead, I want to play you in chess. I'm not that good. You taught your son how to play. John felt his chest twist. There was pain, but it was down on the side of his left calf. Brandon. The kid blinked. I'm not sure you didn't give his name online. You just called him the Spitfire. His chest twisted tighter. Do you know what they're doing now, my family? You were divorced. You were dating a woman you called uh, Mother of Owls in the dedication of your last book. John remembered an owl who frequented the trees just outside his office window, usually on cloudy days. She came in to watch him with her coffee sometimes while he typed. She was still and quiet, so he knew, so he knew he, she was there, but could forget when he needed to as he worked. She was still while he wrote, and he loved her for it. I know what you mean here, Max Booth says, but you, but use, but the use of still makes it sound like you're missing a word afterward. Consider rewording for an alternate word. Okay, so it's confusing because it could be still, as in still happening. She was, she was, um, unobtrusive doesn't sound right. I could use quiet again. Um, 
she was mindful, let's say, of his need for solitude. Okay. She was mindful of his need for solitude while he wrote, and he loved her for it. I think that's better, and it was a good note by Max. All right. Andrea. Yeah, I don't know, Mr. Foster. I could I could reboot if you want to do something else instead. John held up a hand. No, I, I don't want to forget. You forget everything if you reboot? No, I don't know. I was It wasn't Andrea. That was Brandon's mom. No, Manon. Manon Sh Chouette. She wasn't there that day. After a long pause, the kid asked, Do you want to play without the timer? John stared at the board. That would be better. My mind doesn't work as good since I died. The kid laughed, and John moved one of his knights. The kid had him in checkmate in three or four moves. John lost count. Told you I wasn't good. Can we play again, Mr. Foster? Or I could I could get a different game. I just like chess, and I like your books. Even the crime fiction stuff my mom doesn't like me reading. John flexed his hand under the concrete table between them. No pain in the knuckles. No ruptured flesh showing through to the facade of life yet. Chess is fine, kid. The last guy that challenged me to a match beat me up in the ring. The kid reset the board. Why would he do that? He was mad at me for killing the character. Was it Lady Quick? John rolled his eyes. You too? I thought it made sense. Any Anyone can die in CNS, right? I just killed her because I didn't know what to do with, with her anymore. John lasted a few more moves this time. He reset the board. You know how I died? You're white this time. You go first. Two moves in, the kid finally answered. Snake bite. They said it was an allergic reaction to the anti-venom and not just the bite itself. They couldn't wake you up again. Then the stuff they gave you to counteract the reaction caused your heart not to conduct electricity. I think they may name the condition after you based on an article I read. Great. John decided to move his bishop, but then regretted it. They reset the pieces. You never want to be the guy that gets a disease named after you. What kind of snake? Copperhead, I think. Fine copperheads are the worst. They're the same color as the leaves and won't flee like other snakes. Manon wanted us to move because of them. I guess she was right. What would you be doing now if you didn't have to be here playing with me, Mr. Foster? Rotting in a box with no electricity in my heart. No, I mean in your writing. I'd take Manon somewhere nice to eat. I'd find some time for my son. We can stop if you want, Mr. Foster. John stared across into the kid's eyes. He needed a haircut. I got nowhere else to be. Reset the board, kid. I think you got your moves. I think I got your moves figured out. I doubt it. My real name's Bad Seth, not Foster. You can call me John. The boy extended his hand. I'm Devin. They played a long time with the sun never moving overhead. John didn't get any better. He stood over a broad pool of steaming water. Outside the windows, there was a snowy medieval city and a frozen sea beyond that. A group of men in cowboy hats and armor rode through one of the nearly deserted streets beyond the wall of the keep. Oh, God, John whispered, I know where this is. A woman stepped out of the shadows and dropped her robe. She looked like she could use a bath and some privacy. She was wearing Lady Quick's silver bands. As she sank into the water, she said, Am I going to have to reboot you, or are you going to play along this time? Playing along? She turned her back and spread her hairy arms on the edge of the pool. Start with my shoulders, my lord, and tell me the tales of the lands beyond yonder sea. John took a deep breath and picked up a brush. All right. John sat across from Devon in a restaurant booth. There was candlelight, and the Eiffel Tower rose lit through the window beside them. The geography was wrong for this to really be Paris at night. Um, kid, not that I'm complaining compared to the last couple encounters, but chess in the park again or a burger and fries would have been just fine. Devon smiled and stepped out of the booth. She sat down across from John in Devon's place. Manon. All right, what's Max got to say? Uh, do a better job of introducing your presence here. Seems weird. Feels like a typo. Okay. So I, I, what I wanted to do was have it be abrupt, like he's not expecting her. Um, a woman stepped up. A woman stepped up and sat down across from John and Devin's place. Manon. 
I dream about you a lot, she said. This is better than rushing you to the hospital every night with snakes in the car with us. John shivered. He watched Devin find a seat at a bench across the empty restaurant. John took her hand. I'm so glad to see you again. Tell me everything. I miss you all the time. I'm sorry I left you. Tell me what you're doing now. Tell me about Brandon. Tell me tell me about when you're happy. All right. They spoke for hours. The sun never came up, but eventually she had to go. They both faded before he could thank Devin. Devin stayed near the back of the great ship with red sails. The kid looked to be in his late teens now, and finally got a decent haircut. John recognized the city and the coast as the Red Prince Gulch from his books. Devin knew John didn't like this kind of stuff, but John let it go because Manon was here. She leaned her head against his shoulder. How is your new job going? She took a deep breath. I'm pregnant. John turned her to face him. Is it? Was it? He moved his hand back and forth between them. She laughed. You've been gone for years now. No, I got married. Did I not tell you that? It didn't come up. His jaw hurt and he felt air on his gums for a split second. His cheek was gone. He, he, struck his, he stuck his white spotted tongue out to feel the edge of the flesh, but the cheek was saw back, soft and warm. <clears throat> Her eyes widened and she turned to the sea. I guess I didn't want to ruin the illusion of whatever this is. She saw. She saw what's underneath. I'm happy for you. I want, I want you to tell me what's going on with you. I'm happy. Does that make you mad? <clears throat> like I'm forgetting you? No, I want you to live. I, I should have married you and had a baby with you. You were an old man. A baby would have made you older. I wouldn't have minded getting old with you. She turned her face into his chest. You should have moved us out of that woods before the snakes got you then. When you're right, you're right. As he held her, dark lines formed across the backs of his hands, and his heart stopped beating. He did his best to ignore it. They skated around the massive Christmas tree in the center of the rink one more time in silence. John sighed and saw his breath. The sight chilled him down, chilled him deeper as he held Manon's gloved hand. So, what is Matilda doing these days? Still growing? Manon dropped his hand. Nothing new to tell you. Do you want to stop coming here? Am I keeping you from moving on? Nothing to move on from, she said. Turns out this was the real world all along, and life was the dream. What happened, Manon? I want to take my skates off. They're hurting my ankles. We can get hot chocolate if you want. She skated away and John stopped. He could see the ice through the black and split down his wrist bone. He pulled down his coat sleeve to cover it. As Devin skated up, John watched Manon drift away along the ice. How did she die? What? John shook his head. Don't bullshit me, kid. Out of the three of us, you're the only one still aging. How, how are you... How... What are you now? In your 30s? Early 30s, Devin said. Car accident. Her daughter was in it too. Eight years old. A few years a few years ago. Were you trying to protect me? I'm dead, you know. Nothing can hurt me. I think we've known each other long enough to know that isn't true, John. John and Devin sat on a bench as they watched Manon and her daughter playing with Manon's husband. How do you afford to keep doing this, Devin? My dad had money, so I have money. How are the boys doing? Uh, growing like weeds. Uh, spend time with them. It's over before you know it. I know. Do you play these games with anyone else? I see my dad sometimes. Relived game six of the last World Series. He enjoyed it. I think we're killing them. Pardon? John drummed his fingers on the bench until he heard the bones clicking. Her widowed husband needs to move on, too. I could stop, Devin said. I, I enjoy spending time with you. You need to live while you're alive. I do. It's fine. Sucks being dead. Devin tried his best to keep from smiling. I don't understand why you think you can still sense a coffin. Because that's where I really am. No offense, but there's not much in that box anymore, and none of it is still you. What you feel there is as made up as what's going on here. The bite on his leg tingled and his heart felt out of rhythm. There was a guy who told me it would be better if I believed in God. Jevin, Devin, John, and Udo sat around the table with the unfinished game of Clue between them. They talked for hours after Jack Ketchum refused to keep playing. He sat across the room drinking with James Herbert and Terry Pratchett. Udo continued, For me, it is a studio with a garden. Many others have cottages through the hills and mountains near me. For some, they see it as a concert hall, 
with all is there. One lady near the lake tells me she still sees streets of gold. And they believe this is heaven, Devin asked. Whatever makes the board games and the prize fights possible makes the time between possible for those that believe it. I just have to pretend to believe, John rolled the Colonel Mustard token between his fingers. Udo held a Professor Plum. We're pretending now. Devin sat down in a chair next to John and handed him a, a paperback. You picked a hotel lobby for your heaven? It's a convention. There are dealer's rooms and a restaurant. Every friend, okay, intentionally using both. All right, I got a missing word. That's what's going on. Every friend, and I guess that's the last comment because I moved over. Every friend and asshole I've ever known has a room up the hall. There are like infinite floors in this place. Used to think these events were, were my hell, but it's what I can pretend to believe in. Are you? Devin laughed and ran his fingers through his graying hair. I have a grandkid on the way now, but I'm still kicking. If you, if I ask to meet with you, but don't name a place, I end up here. I'll save you a seat. John looked at the at the book. It was the latest on the on the range series by Brandon Vadseth. Foster's burdened. He's still writing, and good at it too. Westerns are making another comeback. Devin leaned over and handed John some photos. Your grandkids are doing great. Great grandkid on the way, I understand. If you want to look around, I'm just going to read for a while. Everyone's here, and more coming all the time. Devin held up a book, held up book one of the Crossbows and Six Shooter series. I'll read with you. I'm, I'll read with you. I'm revisiting some classics. I wrote other genres too. I know. I read them all, even your short stories. I had to play Dungeons and Dragons again the other day. Genghis Khan was there. After a pause, Devin asks, you want to tell me about it? Let me get through a couple chapters first. One bony, fing bony festering finger turned a page before going back to living flesh. All right, that is the story. And um, I like it. It's kind of based on the uh, concept um, that... Uh, that... Um, Oh, I love Pratchett too, man. Thanks. <laughs> I got I, again. I said earlier, I got to get some female authors in there. I I left them out of the story, unfortunately. So one of the big changes I'm going to make is to include some uh, female writers and in, in with the the uh, mentions. Um, the concept was a kind of that idea of uh, if you could have if you could sit or eat with anybody, living or dead, uh, who would it be? And I just imagined what those guys would feel like if they were constantly getting pulled into Dungeons and Dragons games or having to talk about their work with uh, random fans. Um, and then I, the concept, the, um, the story prompt uh, that got me to finally write that story uh, from Max's Patreon page or the um, Perpetual Motion Machine Patreon page. Um, go back and look at Dungeons & Dragons. Oh, got it. Thank you. I had a, I had a bad apostrophe in there. I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that made me go back to back to that story and finally write it was that the prompt was um, you're right the main character is a corpse, and I, I didn't know how to do that. But then I remembered that that story had kind of been uh, rolling around in my head, so I decided to um, I decided to do something about that uh, to to kind of, kind of finally get that story out. And that was kind of the idea I was looking for. Like if uh, you designed your own heaven, would it be like a hotel? with conventions and that kind of thing, or would it be something different and what would it be like? Um, so I kind of had to wrap a, a plot around that. Um, I, pre I appreciate uh, everybody um, who's watching this on Patreon and, and thank you, Josh, for jumping in here live as I'm figuring out how this works and scenes and everything of that nature. Um, my next one is going to be a reading from Yard Full of Bones. We're going to look and talk about the new cover and I'll read the first section of that. And then I might um, also include kind of looking at some of uh, Armand Rose Amelia, the co-authors, other books, and uh, talking about the ones I like of those. So, again, appreciate everybody who's watching this. And um, thank you uh, for, for being my very first uh, uh, viewer and, and uh, chat person. It kind of kind of made it feel a little more real. So I, I appreciate you being here for me, man. And um, we will uh, see you all at next time.